Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, it's a little difficult for me to sit here and listen to you say it's the Congress's responsibility when this administration has, and the President has publicly said that the second article of the Constitution tells, gives him the authority to do whatever he wants. And the amount of discretion that you have tried to, the administration, I should say, in this field have been challenged in court. The courts have so far uh, upheld things like funding of the, of the border wall, uh, separation of children. So your attorney, I assume you believe in precedent, Deferred action started in the early 70s. I was told in the Nixon administration, there's been iterations all along allowing for discretion, administrative discretion. And then now suddenly you say the Congress needs to act. And I would like, as I said at the last hearing, the historical perspective, at least in the last five sessions, uh, Senate Bill 744, the so-called Gang of Eight uh, Bill, four Republicans, four Democrats passed out of the House with bipartisan support led by Senator Schumer and Durbin and McCain and Rubio. Uh, then it got over here, and we're told now through articles in the press and interviews by Mr. Bannon uh, that he and others went to elements of the Republican caucus, and I'm not privy to this, um, but argued that that bill should never come up because it was a good wedge issue for, for, for politics. So it never came up. Recently in the last session, Will Hurd, a very well-respected Republican member, and Pete Aguilar introduced a very similar bill uh, again, um, the speaker never brought it up. So any member is free to put a piece of legislation in and let the public see what it is, and I would encourage my colleagues on the other side to do that, and I'd be happy to work with them. But this context that um, it's everyone's fault defies what we've been told in the press about the dynamics in the other caucus. So having said that, I want to turn my attention specifically to one case, and you've talked about process, and you've been very dispassionate about it. Uh, Mr. Renault, who was here last time, in the case of Isabel Abueso, who's become, the family's become dear friends. Um, they came here legally, by the way. Uh, they were here legally under a tourist visa. They were invited to the United States under a federal program to be part of a, a, a medical trial that's kept her alive. She was seven years old when she came here from Guatemala. She's now 24. Uh, her doctor, a very well-respected uh, doctor at the University of California, San Francisco uh, Children's Facility in Oakland, says if she goes back to Guatemala, she will die because she can't get the weekly treatment she gets. So you said all of these people were here illegally. In this case, at least, that's not the, not the truth. Now, maybe we, we can argue some of the parameters of that, but I want to read the letter that she got, uh, as I understand it, your direction from the field office director in San Francisco. Uh, dear Ms. Bo Ms. Boiso, thank you for your request for deferred action for U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services field offices. No longer consider deferred action request except those made according to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security policies for certain military members. The evidence of record shows that when you submitted your request, you were lawfully present in the United States. So even your department recognizes, contrary to your earlier comments, that she was here legally. Your period of authorized stay has expired. You are not authorized to remain in the United States. If you fail to depart the United States within 33 days of the date of this letter, USCIS may issue a notice to appear and commence removal proceedings against you in the immigration court. So Ms. Boiso, she was asked at the last meeting, how did she take this when she received this letter? She was at the hospital receiving treatment. Her mom gave her the letter and she told us that she vomited that she was so upset they had to take. So how can you, uh, as dispassionately as you describe this, Ms. Renault said, I'm, I'm not finished and there is a process here, um, and it's Congress's process. He said, Mr. Grothman, he wouldn't answer my questions, but questions Mr. Grothman, he said, oh, there would have been a file. We would have known about her. We would have pulled the file and some that should have gone up the chain of command. So did you ever hear about Isabel Boiso before you made this direction? Before this was decided, no, sir. Did you ever think of the consequences for people like her? Did you ever think that with all the other things you have to do, and I respect that, and I also respect the fact that Congress needs to come together, um, but you still have consequences, and as the record shows, multiple administrations, and she was, she, in her case, was approved for deferred action by your administration. So all of a sudden things changed. 
she's here, she's under a program, she's saving people's lives, Americans' lives and others, under a much respected American federal government program, and then she gets this letter. You're responsible for that. Would you care to respond? Uh, when we withdrew on August 7th from uh, granting affirmative requests for deferred action, we knew that that authority continued to exist and any, anyone who would have received such a letter could have or would have been in a process where they could also get it from a more appropriate source other than us. And as Mr. Renault, who you referenced, also said that day, uh, the, the adjudicator who would have been dealing with a particular case, I believe is what Mr. Renault was referring to, would have known about it. That doesn't mean that all, however many hundred cases, are, are all known at any given time by a regional director or the head of field operations or myself at any given time. Um, and usually only a small portion of them are, are, are ever learned about. So the gentleman's time has, has expired.